everyone. My name is Ray Wynn Grant. I'm a conservation scientist here at the American Museum of Natural History. And I work in the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation. This is my office. And I'm here to talk to you about some of my research, which studies the behaviors of black bears in human-dominated areas. So to begin, I want to just kind of orient everybody to where I do my work and where black bears can be found. So if we look here at this globe, you can see that this is the continent of North America. I, right now, am speaking to you from New York, but my research takes me all the way across North America to the Lake Tahoe Basin, which is on the border of Nevada and California. Although my work is here in Lake Tahoe, uh, black bears can actually be found all over North America. They're a very ubiquitous species here. So they're in Canada, they're up and down the West Coast. Black bears can be found in northern parts of Mexico, in the southern United States, in the Midwest, and on the East Coast of the United States. Um, and so they're a very common species, actually, and are a species that is not endangered. So it's a really great conservation success story to know that black bears are very abundant and are doing pretty well in the United States. And so the research that I do takes me to the field. So I leave New York, I fly out to the west to a very arid desert-like environment um, on the eastern slopes of the Sierra Nevada mountain range in Nevada. And I get really down and dirty, a lot of camping, a lot of hiking, a lot of time out in the wilderness to track black bears to trap them in order to attach a GPS collar which monitors their movements. Monitoring their movements is how I basically collect data. And when I bring that data back here to the Natural History Museum, I do a lot of the nitty gritty statistical modeling of that data. So I sit at my computer for months on end trying to figure out um, the statistical properties of their behavioral patterns. But the fun thing to talk about is the field research and to talk about all about black bears. So I have some things to show you, but I would love to kind of start with a little bit of basic black bear biology. Um, black bears vary in body size. The small ones, especially on the east coast of the United States, are usually around 100 to 150 pounds. And bears can get all the way up to, you know, even the seven, eight hundred pound range, especially in the western United States. They can really be huge. And black bears are a very solitary species. So unless we're talking about a mother with her cubs, they're usually found alone, unlike other species of carnivores that can be in prides or packs. And black bears are omnivores. So although they eat meat, um, and they certainly enjoy eating meat, they can often be found to eat nuts and berries and insects and pine cones and all those types of things. So they're really attracted to lots of different foods, and because of that we call them generalists in terms of their diet. They're also generalists in terms of their habitat preferences. So like I showed on the globe, they can be found all throughout the United States, which means they're habitat generalists. They can be found in very arid, very hot desert-like regions. They can be found in coastal areas and the beaches. They can be found in high elevation, very cold mountain ranges, in very wet and moist environments, and very dry. They're habitat generalists. They're all over the United States, and they're really fascinating to study. So I think we're going to jump in with a couple questions um, to get us started. I think we wanted to sort of start off, um, why is it important to understand like the relationship between bears and humans? And, and what is that relationship, uh, especially in the places that you're studying? Certainly. So some of you who are tuning in might be very familiar with black bears because you've come into contact with them yourself. Others of you, like myself when I was growing up in big cities, might not be that familiar with bears because you really never encounter them. You're not in the wild that much. Um, however, a lot of people live in areas where black bear populations either also live or where they are expanding into these areas. And it's really important to understand what that means both for the growth of black bear populations as well as the growth of human populations in these areas. So what I like to kind of tell people is that Black bears and people often prefer the same resources. 
people like water, people like food, people like forest environments, and it's the same for bears. So where I work in the Lake Tahoe region, there's a lot of water in the form of really big lakes. People like those lakes because it provides excellent recreation. We can go boating, we can go you know, water skiing, we can just kind of splash around in the water. And bears like it because it provides excellent habitat. However, as you can imagine, ha overlapping bear habitat and human habitat can be fairly dangerous for these animals and for people. Bears can become aggressive at times and it's often best for people to really maintain their distance for bears. So part of the goals of my work are to understand how humans on, in the environment can impact bear movement and bear behavior. And once we understand that properly and we can make predictions for the future, I can provide some recommendations to wildlife managers in the area about how to best manage the bear populations and how to best manage how humans might expand into the environment. Um, you talked about you know, resources and general habitats. Are there any, any particular seasons, any particular things that, that sort of would attract bears or make bears more likely to come in contact with humans? Certainly. So this is an excellent question. And bears lead very specific lives in terms of their temporal patterns, which is times throughout the year. So what a lot of people already know about bears, black bears and others, is that they spend a good amount of time in hibernation. So during the winter months, bears will completely shut down. They go into hibernation, usually in some kind of secure shelter area. So under a log, in a cave, which is kind of the cliche place that bears hibernate etc. And they fall asleep more or less for the winter. So all of their biological patterns really shut down. Their heartbeat slows down, their internal recycling slows down, and they basically are in a very cathartic state for four to six months of the year, depending on the location. And during those times, we usually find that there aren't very many issues between black bears and humans because they're just asleep. Um, and humans are also staying indoors. Contrast that with the period called hyperphagia. And hyperphagia is the biological period that a black bear experiences when it is preparing for hibernation. So this usually starts in the late summer and early fall. And the idea of hyperphagia is that bears are eating as much as they possibly can, just consuming tons and tons of calories in order to prepare their body for four to six months of hibernation. And so they absolutely go crazy. They eat all day long, anything they can find. Why this is important for people who live in areas with black bears is that this period of hyperphagia can be so intense that sometimes we'll find black bears coming into human areas, small towns, the edges of towns, even larger towns and cities, and raiding especially garbage cans. So if there's any kind of human food resources that are easily available for bears, they'll often take advantage of it because it really helps them survive the winter. So often when we see bears in the news, it's because we'll see them creeping through towns during their period of hyperphagia, looking for some easy, easily accessible food items. And we got a question from uh, John David Rally on Facebook, which is, can a bear wake up during hibernation? Thank you, John David. So I just want to spend a second to reintroduce myself. My name is Ray Wynn Grant. I am a postdoctoral conservation scientist here at the American Museum of Natural History. And in particular, I work in the Center for, Bio, Bio, <laughs> the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation, excuse me. Um, and the question that we just at, got asked was, is it possible for black bears to wake up during hibernation? Interestingly enough, it is possible. So unfortunately, black bears shut down their bodies but are able to be aroused. And this is a response that actually keeps them protected. So in an instance where uh, another predator is threatening the bear and entering its hibernation den, the bear can actually come out of hibernation to fight the predator off if necessary. This can become tricky though, if it's not a predator coming to disturb the bear. In the area that I work in the Lake Tahoe region, sometimes we find that humans are actually waking up bears during hibernation. And this happens because in this region, there's a lot of outdoor recreation. There's skiing, 
there's snow shoeing around, there's a lot of winter hiking, um, mostly skiing in bear habitat. And sometimes when people zoom across, what they don't realize is a um, black bear den, they can disturb the bear. With male bears or with female bears that don't have cubs, this often means that the bear wakes up, gets upset, and relocates to a new den. However, we find that when female bears actually have cubs in their den, they often will abandon the cubs there. The cubs will often be too small um, and too immature to actually join their mother when she leaves the den because of a human disturbance. And that often means the death of the cubs. So again, part of my work works to address what we know about bear behavior in these human environments so that we can avoid as much as possible people disturbing bear dens, which can lead to a decline in the population. And Ray, can we talk about, uh, you know, you've got some, some of the equipment here. Talk about like what life is like in the field for you and, and what you're actually doing when you're in the field. Certainly. So I'll save some of these pictures for last, but I already introduced everyone and oriented you to the part of the world where I specifically study black bears, which on this globe is the Lake Tahoe Basin. Lake Tahoe is that tiny little speck of water right there in the border between Nevada and California. <clears throat> I've brought along with me some things that I use in the field. Um, I always have a hat because, like I said before, I work in a very hot and arid part of the country where temperatures can go sky high and it's extremely dry, so at the least you need to shield your face from the sun. Um, I also happen to be wearing a shirt, which I can talk a little bit about later, but it says Bear Logic, and on the back we have a little slogan. And I'll talk about it in a few minutes, but basically we have these shirts and some other materials that try to encourage the public to really be bear aware um, when they're in black bear habitat. But moving through some of my field items. So the most important things that I carry with me are binoculars. And one of the reasons that I use binoculars in the field, and these are actually really good binoculars that are pretty heavy duty and digital, is because it is not my intention to get up close and personal with a bear unless it has been tranquilized. Um, that is very dangerous. And so I try to protect myself. So often when I'm scanning for bears, it's from a considerable distance. And I use my binoculars to really just see up close. Um, I'm also, <clears throat> it's very common that I will find lots of other species while I'm using these binoculars. Interesting birds, other types of small carnivores, etc. So this is crucial for the field, especially for my own safety. I often use a GoPro, and this one in particular was loaned to me by a fellow researcher of mine, Peter, or friend, researcher friend of mine, Peter Houlihan, who uses them in his work. And this GoPro helps me document a lot of the field work I do, which for now just contributes to some really good video watching late at night, um, but helps me understand some of the techniques I use and get a good sense for how um, bear field work goes. So later on, maybe we can see some of those videos. But a GoPro is a fantastic invention. You just strap it to your head. You can record everything that you're doing. And really, it can help educate the public about what this type of field work is like. I have a couple of books, and these are a little bit worn and torn, but they have been very special to me since I started doing field work um, over a decade ago. And the first book is called How to Stay Alive in the Woods, <laughs> and it literally gives you all kinds of advice about when you're camping, or like me, when you're doing field work, searching for bears, camping for days and days on end. Um, just some things that you might need, what plants to eat, what plants not to eat, how to make a fire, etc. It's a really handy for anyone who's venturing out to the wilderness for the first time. I highly recommend it. This one is less handy, but makes for some funny reading. It's called the Worst Case Scenario um, Survival Handbook, and it helps you figure out all kinds of things about what if everything goes completely wrong, what do I do? There's even some bear things, bear-related things in here. I want to jump in here with a question from Ilya Scoby on Facebook. Have you ever discovered anything through your binoculars that really shocked you? Thank you for the question. Absolutely, I have. 
So using these binoculars, very often I find no animals. I see lots of great scenery, maybe some insects, but not a lot of animals. But by using these binoculars, I have been very privy to some wonderful acts of nature that will stay with me forever. I have been able to capture from a safe distance um, black bears fishing in rivers and actually catching salmon and trout and other freshwater um, fish species, which I wouldn't have been able to see um, if I hadn't been really looking for it. I've also been able to catch some really large predators. So I've been able to find some mountain lions every so often from a safe distance using my binoculars, which has been really thrilling because understanding where black bears are and where some of their competitor species are, like mountain lions, also helps us understand the science about what's going on in these regions. So great question. So I want to show you guys some of the most important tools that I use in the field. Although I do a lot of trapping and tranquilizing black bears in order to attach GPS collars on them to collect data, a different non-invasive way that I'm able to collect data is to use what we call camera traps. And I brought two different ones here today that um, are two different sizes. But these camera traps, as you can see, are um, camouflage, most importantly. They have a bungee cord here, which we can strap to a small tree. And camera traps essentially have a motion detector. So what's important to note here is that I will open up the camera trap and adjust its settings so the camera trap can take, and it uses a lot of batteries as you can tell, but the settings can be adjusted inside of here. Right now it's off, I turn it on, and basically can decide this will take you know, a picture every couple seconds, this will take a picture only when there's motion detection, etc. And when I strap these camera traps to trees very deep in the forest, I will also place some kind of bait there to lure a bear if a bear is within a few mile radius. So the bait that I usually set is just a scent. So you can go to the grocery store and get a vanilla extract from the baking department or a raspberry extract. Those are great baits for black bears. And I just get a rag and I douse it with the vanilla or the raspberry scent and tie it to the tree just under the camera trap. And essentially what happens is that whenever there's some kind of large amount of motion in the view of the camera, there it will take a picture. And this means that sometimes I get pictures of squirrels and sometimes I get pictures of tree branches swaying back and forth in the breeze. But it means that very often, if I'm lucky, I will get pictures of black bears foraging around in the forest. And that tells us a couple things. It tells us that indeed in these backcountry parts of the forest, black bears do exist. There's a population there. And it also tells us when there are no black bears likely in an area. So that helps us understand, okay, black bears haven't gotten to this part of the landscape yet, or perhaps we just missed them, or perhaps they just weren't hungry and didn't go for the bait. So this is a small camera trap, um, which can be used with smaller trees. And then this one here is an example of a larger camera trap. And again, it has a larger lens, so it can capture more of the landscape when it's taking the picture. And I would use a bigger bungee cord to essentially strap it around a larger tree. So not just black bear researchers, but a lot of different conservation biologists use these traps because it's a very non-invasive, very safe way for us to collect data about wild animals without actually distracting them or causing any distress. And I'd like to show you guys a couple of pictures that I've collected from my camera traps. So the first one here, and I hope you can see it, shows a black bear during the day. So this is a large male bear, and it's right here, its little head, um, in a juniper um, growth in the forest in rural parts of Nevada. And this bear was caught on my camera trap in a place where we really weren't sure that black bears existed. So it was really exciting that after about a week of having the camera trap there straight, a week of no images of bears, we finally caught one. On the flip side, this is a night image caught by a camera trap, actually just a few feet from where I was camping, <laughs> um, where we were able to again catch a smaller juvenile male bear 
foraging around in an area where we weren't sure that black bears existed. So again, I can geolocate these images on a map and then help wildlife managers understand where bears might um, be moving through in this part of the country. Now, you mentioned that that bear was pretty close to where you were camping, and we had a uh, similar question from both uh, Matt Gardner and Oba Davis on Facebook, and that is, have you ever had a, an up-close and personal or, or, or a little bit unnerving encounter with a bear in the field? And if so, would, what do you do there? Um, well, thank you, Matt and Oba, for asking that question about up-close and personal experiences with bears. So in the line of work that I do, and a lot of conservation biologists experience this, every so often you have a run-in with the animal that you're studying. Often when I'm running in with these animals, again, I have trapped them and I have tranquilized them and I'm handling them in a very safe manner. But every so often I stumble across a bear that is not trapped or tranquilized and there are certainly some behaviors that I need to remember to employ to keep myself safe. So, the last time this happened, I made the mistake of coming upon a large male bear who was not very happy that I was in his area and started making some aggressive movements. So, one thing that they do is they start pawing the ground and they put their head down and kind of swish their head back and forth and pawing the ground and grunting. That means get out of there. The thing you don't want to do is run. So when a large carnivore like a bear sees another animal running, it will often think that that animal is prey and might chase it. So never run. The best thing to do is to get as big as possible, stand up on your tippy toes. If you have a jacket, take your jacket off and hold it above your head. Walk away slowly while holding the jacket above your head and being big and speak in a low and resonant voice. I'll give you an example. Something that a lot of people in the field say is, go away bear. So you get big, you use your deep voice, you say, go away bear, and you start animal. And more than anything, carry bear spray with you. So I almost always, in my pack or in the truck that I'm driving, have a couple of cans of bear spray. It's not legal to have in cities like New York, but in bear country, it's absolutely a, necess a necessity. It's essentially like pepper spray that we'll use for assailants um, in urban areas, but it has a longer spray um, distance, and so you can really kind of deter the bear by spraying the spray, make sure you're not downwind of it, and backing away slowly, and you should be all right. I will note that there are plenty of species of bears, but black bears are considered to be one of the most um, gentle and non-aggressive of the species. Um, Raywin, uh, we, we have a question from uh, Chuck Snow, which is, when you're in the field, what sort of data are you collecting? Thank you, Chuck. That's a great question, and often I get carried away talking about what field work is actually like versus what types of data I'm actually looking for. So I collect a, a lot of different types of data. Number one, I'm looking at movement patterns so that I can determine habitat selection of these animals. So like I mentioned before, I'm attaching GPS collars um, to a lot of these black bears. And these collars actually transmit a signal to a satellite. And then that satellite downloads the GPS location to my computer. And so I will get a GPS fix, is what we call it, when the satellite uploads the location every four hours. And so if I have collars on 10 bears, I'm getting GPS fixes every four hours from them in terms of their location. When I have that information in my computer, I can then map it onto the landscape and I can see what movement actually looks like on the landscape for a bear. What I'm looking for then is to do some statistical analyses to determine which types of habitats bears prefer and which types of habitats they are avoiding. And that can help us understand why. Are they avoiding parts of the forest because there's a lot of human recreation there? Are they attracted to parts of the forest because there's human presence or because there's a lack of human presence? It's different for different parts of the country. And it helps us understand how humans and bears can coexist together. 
and I think we're going to let you uh, wrap up and get back to your work uh, today. I think we just want to take one more question from uh, Joe Allen Boyer on Facebook, which is, uh, back to the, the trail cams, what's the weirdest thing you've ever caught on a trail cam? <laughs> Anything <laughs> unexpected? Um, sure, certainly. So I would say that the weirdest thing I've ever caught when I'm going through the disc in here to look at what types of images we've captured Probably the weirdest thing I've ever captured were pictures of me. <laughs> so sometimes I will fail to remember where I've set up a camera trap because, again, they are camouflaged and it's the forest. And so you'll see pictures of me kind of walking back and forth looking for the camera trap, <laughs> which is pretty hilarious, but I often look ridiculous at doing it. Um, but in terms of wildlife and in terms of nature, I have been really excited to have captured a bunch of species that I didn't know were in this part of the environment. So I've captured bobcats, mountain lions, different types of fox. Um, I've captured animals that are sometimes mating on camera <laughs> and um, animals that are sometimes hunting. So I've actually had a couple of incidents where there's been a fox that has taken down a bird right on camera and you really get that kind of National Geographic, you know, um, wildlife documentary footage um, on accident. And so that's always really, really thrilling. But definitely the weirdest species I've caught on camera is human. <laughs> so thank you guys so much. This has been wonderful. I encourage everyone to uh, come to the Natural History Museum if you can. We have great exhibits on North American mammals um, in the museum, including bears. And I am always here to take more questions later and hope that you guys enjoyed a little bit of my research.